I'm Joan Beal with CCSVI Alliance, and I'm very, very thankful to have our keynote speaker at the ISNVD here with us today, Dr. Paula Gramis. Thank you, Joan. Hi, everybody. And Dr. Gramis, if you would like to introduce sure. yourself and tell us yes. where are you from and... Yeah. Well, I'm originally from New York, but uh, I am a Texas Tech Health Sciences Center in Lubbock, Texas, a professor of neurology there and director of the Garrison Institute on Aging. I've been there about nine years, and recently in, in January, I assumed a an additional position where I'm director of uh, an organization in Texas called the Texas Alzheimer's Research and Care Consortium, of which Texas Tech is part of, one of six institutions, in a program that was developed by the state to bring researchers and clinicians together to look at Alzheimer's disease and do some creative collaborations. So I'll still maintain a position at Texas Tech, but I'll also be directing the, the larger consortium, which uh, involves other researchers in Texas. And uh, Texas is actually pretty forward thinking about Alzheimer's and public private partnerships and ways that we can push research forward. Yes, yeah. so that was interesting yeah, to see great. that. So you have a dialogue going between different universities right. in Texas. Right. And that's helping right. move the research forward. Well, the consortium was formed a number of years ago and they built a patient cohort with the institutions, Good. enrolling people and creating a database that'll be open to researchers to do hopefully interesting and novel research so studies. So other, other researchers outside of your consortium? Okay. Now, I had a question for you. Your research is very unique in the fact that you are not focusing on the beta amyloid plaques right. that most Alzheimer's researchers have been focusing on. Right. And I was curious, what began your investigation into the endothelial cells in Alzheimer's? Okay, well, in Alzheimer's, everybody knows that the, the nerve cells in the brain die. Yes. $64,000 question is why that happens. Right. And as you know, there's a lot of different theories. Amyloid has been one of the theories that's been most pursued for a number of years, but we began with a pretty simple perspective, and we said that the nerve cells in the brain are highly dependent on their environment. The nerve cells are very delicate. Right. They like things just so, and it's the job of the brain endothelial cell to create that environment. So to us, it seemed logical that in a disease where nerve cells are unhappy and they die, right. that maybe it's because the endothelial cell doesn't provide a normal environment for them to, to be viable and successful. And when we started this project, I want to tell you how many years ago. How many? Oh, a lot. <laughs> um, there really wasn't a lot of information about how brain blood vessels could be different in Alzheimer's disease versus huh. in patients that were age matched but didn't have the disorder. And we began by looking at the, the vessels themselves and see how they were different biochemically. And we published a series of papers over the years that said that the vessels in Alzheimer's are actually quite different than in age matched controls. That they are activated, that they make a lot of noxious products that neurons don't like. And from our perspective, we thought it was really interesting because it opens up a new potential area for a target for therapy. Right. You know, all of the amyloid vaccines, the amyloid-based therapies, I mean, in, in 2014, we have no disease-modifying drugs despite the millions that have gone to test that hypothesis, which doesn't mean that it doesn't have some validity, maybe in some forms of Alzheimer's, but clearly the disease is much more complicated. Right. And we think that at least some forms of Alzheimer's, and I should say that we think that Alzheimer's is not a single disorder. That's, that's likely, an important point that you I mentioned in your, in, your, yeah. in your speech, so that you told us that there are a variety, there's vas there are vascular dementia. There, there are probably many mechanisms that okay. create what we call Alzheimer's disease in the end. And that, you know, amyloid certainly may contribute to some forms, but we think that the vascular, the blood vessel based mechanisms may contribute to many. And there's lots of data now that suggests that vascular risk factors, diabetes, mm -hmm. is now thought to be really important in the development of Alzheimer's hmm. disease, you know, high cholesterol, all the things that mm -hmm. over the years we know have things to do for heart disease, mm -hmm. we think are also relevant for Alzheimer's disease. So our lab has been trying to understand at a sort of cellular or biochemical level how those risk factors play into abnormal function in the brain blood vessels and ultimately how that in involves injuring and, and killing neurons or nerve cells because this is really the crux of what Alzheimer's right. disease is. Now you had an interesting uh, point last night. You said that the brain and the heart are connected. Correct. So it's, it's why is there this disconnect in research that uh, researchers aren't that's interesting. I think, I think because um, Alzheimer's disease is a neurologic disorder, right. obviously the business end or the nerve cells end, people who are in the, neuro, the neuro world don't think about blood vessels. You know, scientists are human beings like everybody else. Right. And we all have our biases. So if you're a neuroscientist and you're interested in neurons, you don't think a lot about blood vessels. And if you're a vascular biologist, sometimes you don't think about the neurons. But if you happen to be like me, a vascular biologist who works in the brain, yes. you, you do think about and see that the connections are, are quite clear. And I think there's more and more data that says we need to think about how many different factors play into what is the final common 
the presentation of Alzheimer's So disease. you were discussing last night microvessel studies that you are mm -hmm. doing, and this is not rodent mm -hmm. studies. Mm -hmm. These are human, this right. is human tissue. And what, I was really surprised by what you were finding is happening in mm -hmm. these microvessels mm -hmm. in Alzheimer's. If you could summarize a few of these proteins and cytokines sure. that you're seeing that, that cycle of inflammation that's happening. Yeah, actually, I think, I think our work has been really interesting because we started with human material. You know, now we've right. actually gone and have validated kind of our hypotheses in animals. But in animals. I think it's really important to have both pieces. And over the years, we've shown that in the blood vessels in the, in the AD brain, that these uh, the endothelial cells, which is the important constituent cell of the blood vessel, produces a lot of different inflammatory proteins. And that many of these inflammatory proteins are also involved in this process of what we call angiogenesis, which means the formation of new blood vessels. Creation of new, new blood, blood vessels. vessels. So if you, I'm Greek, so you know, it comes from the Greek, <laughs> angio. We know our yes, Greek, yes. We know our Greek. So, but it's interesting. So we've shown that these vessels make all these angiogenic factors. Right. But in the Alzheimer's brain, there aren't any new blood vessels. So yeah. you have two observations that appear to be contradictory. So we took those two observations and we said, how could we hypothesize that they are linked? And what we've said is that we know that these, these factors are all up in Alzheimer's. And because there is no new blood vessel formation, for whatever reason, maybe the presence of the beta amyloid, maybe a lot of other things, right. there's no signal to turn the whole process off. So the endothelial cells just keep, keep cranking, cranking out. on all this stuff, which many of the proteins, these antigenic inflammatory proteins, either are directly neurotoxic, yeah. meaning that they kill neurons, they kill. or they stimulate the whole neuroinflammatory process in the brain. They stimulate the other non-neuronal cells, astrocytes, microglia, and then they also contribute inflammatory proteins, mm -hmm. reactive oxygen species, all these toxic mediators floating around in the AD brain. So and, uh, yeah. In your animal studies now with a specific medication right. and anti angiogenic right. right. it's showing that you can actually turn as you said, turn the switched, volume right. down or That's turn exactly the switch right. down on so these endothelial cells. And that was amazing to see the results that you're getting. So we think it's pretty interesting having to find it in the human now formulating this right. hypothesis that we think maybe that first step where all these bad things are made, if mm -hmm. you could turn that down, that it would have some benefit in yeah. Alzheimer's disease, having taken that into two transgenic Alzheimer animal models and showing that in fact the mice show the same thing as the humans, they right. show this vascular activation, this right. overproduction of all these factors, and that if you treat the animals with an anti-angiogenic drug, you can make that better, and ultimately you can make their cognition, their memory better. Mm, that was so amazing. we're super excited because we yeah. think that you know, the potential for a human clinical trial is really pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. And if in fact it's true, it opens up a whole new possible yes. realm of therapeutics, not only the particular drugs that we've been looking at, but whole categories of anti of antiangiogenics could be tested in humans. Wonderful, and that was so. really exciting and very, very hopeful. So we're really looking forward to more we're hopeful research. Too. Yes, excellent. And if you were going to give some lifestyle advice mm -hmm. to people who would want to do and change the things sure. they can change right. today. Absolutely. We know there are lifestyle changes. What, what right. would be your top five? Well, I was going <laughs> to say, you know, the important risk factor for developing Alzheimer's is age. So none of us are changing that. Can't change that. Can't change that. We can yes. try. No, we don't want to change that. But the modifiable risk factors. Yes. I mean, again. Things we can change. The things that we know have some association. Again, it doesn't mean if you do everything right that you won't get of Alzheimer's. Course. But we can say now is you can lower your risk. Yes. And I think that's huge to be able to say you can lower your risk if you do all the, all the right things. And again, what are the right things? The right things are all the things that we've learned that are important for heart disease. Exercise, huge, mm -hmm. lots, of, lots of good animal and human data that says there's improved mental function with exercise, appropriate diet. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about the Mediterranean diet, mm -hmm. the importance of... Greek again. Yeah, Greek again. <laughs> God bless the Greeks. So, um, you know, the importance of varied diet, you know, minimizing mm -hmm. things, processed food, minimizing yes. meats and things like that. So that's all, you know, regulation of cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Huge, lots of data that says people that have high cholesterol in midlife have higher incidence of developing dementia in late life. Again, ah. we think Alzheimer's is doesn't develop like this. You know, it's decades, it time. time, time. So all the things we should be doing uh, in young, in, you know, encouraging young people to yes. adapt to healthy lifestyles regarding exercise and diet, and you know, reduction of stress. As we tell people as they get older, too, the importance of maintaining good socialization. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes elderly people tend to be a little bit more isolated. isolated. That's, that's bad. You know, you mm -hmm. want as much interaction as possible, as much mental stimulation, mm -hmm. and 
And again, I think that the big things are really the exercise and the diet. Those are the things that we yeah. can't control and we should control. Exactly. And the worst case scenario, if they don't prevent Alzheimer's, there's still a healthy lifestyle option. So you'll feel better. Yeah, there's no yes. downside. There's absolutely, you know, weight control. Again, yeah. obesity leading to diabetes. Diabetes, right. huge risk factor for AD. You know, it all sort of falls together. So if the things that we can do, we should do. In the meantime, the rest of us are working on you know, the cure. Right. And, but the things that people can do now to lower their risk, they should be doing. Absolutely. Well, I was just so happy to, to listen Thank to you, you last Thank night you. to see your presentation. Thank and I you. think you're doing such important work. I appreciate that. So Thanks. we will continue to follow you. Excellent. And thank you very much, Dr. Grimmis, for taking it. this it time nice with us. Thank, Thank you. you.